commission has got a role in this. In reverence to God, shall we please be on our feet as I call upon Mr. Samson Boaz to give us the opening prayer. Shall we close our eyes while we short word of prayer? Father Lord Jesus, this morning we call upon you as your children have gathered here. We pray may whatever we are here to do be in your hands. And we pray that you give us the glory, give us the knowledge, wisdom, so we'll be able to protect our children online as we go. These are many more and many things we ask from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much, Mr. Samson Boaz. In an era where privacy... All right, so in an era where everybody is overly exposed, privacy is simply the coolest thing we have to follow. Um, permit me to introduce to you some dignitaries we have in our mess this morning. I am privileged to introduce to you the Deputy Director for Data Protection Commission in the person of Ms. Valerie Hudson. We also have in our mess this morning the Director in Charge of Regulations and Compliance for Data Protection Commission, Dr. Patrick. We have in our mess this morning, Madam Gifty, Sylvia Gifty, appear from Information Governance Solutions. We also have Madam Judith Bonu from Ministry of Communications. We have Madam Salina Oforiwa from GIFEC. In our midst this morning is Mr. Dalin Kwabna Hilbert from SNET. We will continue to do the introduction as the program unfolds. Um, just for highlights, we, the program is in two sections this morning. There will be a series of presentation on the functionalities and mandates of the Data Protection Commission. And then we will zoom to the panel discussion where we would go to the topic of the day. Um, let us take the remarks from the advisor of the National Cyber Security Center. A very good morning to all of you and welcome to this important session. A workshop on maintaining privacy online in the era of COVID-19. Cybersecurity is an important element of the security of every enterprise, every community, but also every state. At the same time, securing our digital ecosystem also requires the protection of people's rights even within the digital space as well. That is why we've incorporated privacy-related discussions as part of our cybersecurity awareness month discussions. If you look at the public sector, uh, a lot of digital services are ongoing. The paperless ports, e-justice system, e-parliament, mobile money, interoperability, national ID system, e-immigration, digital ad uh, property addressing system. At the same time, when you also look at the public sector space, uh, a lot of digital initiatives are ongoing. And of course, COVID-19 has further um, brought to bear uh, the need to use digital system resources for uh, communication, for, for business engagement, and even our social interactions. So there is a need in all this to ensure that uh, individual right 
to privacy, data protection issues are well covered. At least Ghana has a recognition. Uh, we are respected with respect to our work within the cyber security ecosystem. In other words, our approach to cyber security has always been uh, based on the right to protect individual liberties, even online. We are a member of the Freedom Online Coalition, and they agreed for Ghana to host a conference early part of the year because of um, our approach in respecting right, incorporating right, respecting principles uh, into our work. That has reflected in our revision of the national cyber city policy and strategy, but also uh, the drafting of the cyber city bill, which is currently before cabinet. It is also good to uh, emphasize that Ghana was selected to serve on advisory committee of the Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism, partly because of the fact that we take uh, right issues very serious. This is not the only uh, development that has really enhanced our image as a right respecting country. Ghana is a signatory to the African Union Convention on Cyber Security and Personal Data Protection. And uh, we are among the few countries on the African country um, with a cyber security legislation, uh, with, with a data protection legislation, which is the Act 843. So it is important that we take measures to address privacy related issues. Uh, there have been uh, serious breaches globally, and we can cite, for example, in 2015, U.S. Office of Personnel Management, uh, there was a hack in which information about background checks were leaked. In 2019, uh, the Bulgarian revenue management system was also compromised. In 2018, uh, Cambridge Analytica also came, uh, in, in connection with Facebook, also came to life. So there has been a number of high profile breaches of which Ghana can learn from uh, to improve its data protection practices. But at the individual level, um, right to privacy is guaranteed in our constitution. That also includes digital rights. How do we ensure that we realize and you know, enjoy the full right that the constitution provides? First of all, I think we need to know our rights and uh, the uh, Data Protection Act, Act 843. We need to also be privacy conscious. So when we know that we have a right, we also need to take measures to ensure that uh, individually we protect ourselves. But most importantly, we also need to enforce our right. And I think that is what Data Protection Commission is all about. And they have been leading this particular field actively to ensure that our citizens uh, enjoy every digital dividend that technology digitalization provides, but at the same time, we also uh, protect our personal information. This session is an important one to discuss some of these issues and provide us with the necessary guidance in realizing our full rights as digital citizens. I welcome you to this particular session and I wish you fruitful deliberations. Thank you. All right, so we continue with the program by calling upon Ms. Valerie Hudson. She is the Deputy Director for Data Protection Commission. She would give us the remarks on behalf of the Executive Director of the Data Protection Commission. Shall we welcome her? Good morning to all our distinguished guests and all protocols observed. On behalf of the Data Protection Commission and our Executive Director, Madam Patricia Adusayapoku, I would like to warmly welcome you 
to National Cybersecurity Month's Data Protection and Privacy Day, themed Maintaining Privacy Online in the Era of COVID-19. We are living in an era of increased interdependence driven by technological advances such as the internet and mobile connectivity. And information technology has improved our ability to communicate and share information with others. Driving this technological revolution are vast amounts of personal data, which when combined with analytic technologies create innovative and transformative services and solutions. Within Ghana, the implementation of emerging technologies and the rollout of multiple state level digitization projects, such as National ID, the National Digital Property Addressing System, mobile mon money interoperability, and paperless ports have resulted in the growing use of digital services. And this has been accelerated further as a result of COVID-19. COVID-19 has affected every aspect of our lives, from healthcare and education to the economy, resulting in an acceleration of the transition process towards digitization and the adoption of digital solutions. Ladies and gentlemen, as protective measures are being put in place against COVID-19, the critical question is, how can we ensure that they are balanced with privacy safeguards, which is a fundamental human right? So please join us today to find out more about the obligations of data controllers and processors, about how to comply with provisions of the Data Protection Act 843, and to hear about how institutions across different sectors have responded to COVID-19. Thank you. We can do it better. Thank you very much, the Deputy Executive Director for Data Protection Commission, Madam Valerie Hudson. Yes, going right to the first item on the bill, we have a presentation from the Data Protection Commission. And here, Mr. Seth Fosukwaten, who is the Human Resource Manager for Data Protection Commission would give us the presentation. Shall we give it up to him? Good morning. Um, to, uh, hello to our dignitaries, um, the audience, and those joining us online. Um, I'll be covering the obligations of data controllers and processes. Um, the right to privacy is critical for every individual. So talking about the right to privacy, we are looking at the right for you and I to control our personal information. And that is very key. Now, in looking at the right to privacy, we cannot um, um, uh, ignore the obligations that data controllers and processes play in maintaining um, or facilitating their, our right to privacy. So my presentation will cover the mandates of the Data Protection Commission, what our functions are. We will then look at some key terms um, under the Data Protection Commission, and we will look at the principles regarding processing of personal data, and then we also cover the general obligations of data controllers, as well as um, notification of breaches. So Data Protection Commission, we are a regulatory body established by an act of parliament, that is um, Act 843, it came in 2012, which mandates us to protect the privacy of individuals and their personal data. Let me pause here and indicate that sometimes awareness programs, there is a misconception that the commission has a data store citizens' personal data. So we keep everybody's personal data. Please, that is not the case. We only ensure that individuals, companies that handle you and I, our personal data, they are complying with the regulations in the act. So we are the body established by an act of parliament to protect you and our personal data um, as well as a fundamental matter. Now, in terms of the subject matter of the Data Protection Act, the focus of the act is on living individuals. It's on a natural person, 
Okay, so the subject matter of the Data Protection Act is focused on a living individual, so an identifiable person. Okay, all right. Now I want to look at some key terms in the Data Protection Commission uh, under the Data Protection Act. So I'll start with the basics and then I'll, I'll, I'll build up from that. Now let's look at personal data. Now as the name implies, I'm sure as uh, I just mentioned personal data, a lot of examples may begin to flood your mind. So when we talk about personal data, basically we are looking at any information that can be used to identify you as an individual, can be to identify me as a person, okay? Either it, it can identify you directly or indirectly in connection with other information. So if we ask, if I'm, I'm supposed to ask you, the basic uh, example would be what? Your name, your date of birth, your phone number, your hometown, your residential address, online identifiers, what are some online identifiers? For example, your IP address, okay? Uh, you could look at your family information, okay? Where you work. So all of this information, it could either be alone or you would have to combine one or two information to be able to identify you as a person so that we can identify that, oh, so that is Kweku, that is Mr. Asante, that is Elena. So that is what it comes under personal data. The person to whom the data um, is concerned is what we refer to as the data subject. So at the extreme left, we see the personal data, and then we have the data subject. So the person about whom the personal data is concerned is what the act refers to as a data subject. So I'll be using these terms as I continue my presentation. Even today being uh, I'm, I'm focusing on uh, privacy. These are some of the terms which may come up in our discussions. So um, as individuals, the Act recognizes you and I as data subjects. So we've looked at personal data, we've looked at the data subject. Now let's build on from there. So we are going to data controller. Data controller. So who is a data controller? A data controller is simply um, any institution. It could be an institution, it could be a person, uh, it could be a public authority. What they do is that they determine the purpose and means of processing. Okay, and you can see that there's another key term called processing. So we'll come to that. So the data controller determines, okay, that this personal data which I'm collecting, I'm going to use it for this purpose. Let me state here that the main determining factor is control rather than possession. So when you look at data, the key thing is control, control. He, he or she is determining that I'm taking this personal data, I'm going to use it for this, 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 and that purpose. For example, um, a financial institution would have identified that, okay, for us to provide financial services to our clients, we will need their names, we will need their location, we will need their phone numbers. So they've determined what kinds of personal data they will collect, and they've determined what purpose they are going to use it for. So that is essentially who a data controller is. Now let me connect it to uh, a data processor. Um, in one of our awareness sessions, we asked the question, who is a data processor? And picking from the name, someone says someone who processes data. Okay. So personal um, data processor in connection to the data controller is also an institution or it could be an individual who processes personal data on the instructions of the data controller. So the personal the data processor does not hold or control the data. The data processor only holds or works with the personal data on the instructions of the data controller. Let me give uh, an example. So during the, the, the uh, lockdown, um, how many of you received any email alerts or from financial institutions suggesting other ways by which you could assess their financial services? Can I see by raise of hands? Yes, so we have a few hands, yes. All right, so in this case, looking at the controller and processor, the Controller is the financial institution, so your bank, for instance. Now, if um, the bank needed to um, inform its clients that, okay, so during this lockdown, 
if you want to access our financial services, you can go on our online portal or download our mobile app. In sending that information to you and I, they contracted a marketing company to provide that service. That marketing company then becomes a processor. Why? Because they will have personal data of the bank's clients on their own. They wouldn't have had that personal data. But because the bank needed to provide that service to its clients, it contracted a third party to facilitate the delivery of that service. So the marketing company then becomes a data processor. So that's the connection between a data controller and a data processor. Now let's come to processing. Processing um, could mean different things in different fields, but basically under data protection, uh, processing simply refers to uh, any activity or set of operations which is applied to personal data. So once again, you are thinking in your mind, what are some of the sets of operations? All right, so personal data, um, you are all processing me because you are viewing. So viewing is an example of processing. I once uh, joked uh, with my director that even a three-year-old baby or a five-month-old baby can even process personal data. Okay, so processing, uh, looking at uh, any activities. So what are some of the um, activities that we do? So for example, when we came in, um, how many of you registered at the front desk? You all registered, all right. So they, they had a sheet. In, on the sheet, they had determined what personal data they would take, and they had categorized it. So they wanted your name, your phone number. So categorization is an example of processing. Now, after, if they decide to store it, storing is an example of processing. If they decide to share it, let's say they, after the session, they want to send evaluation to participants, and they decide, okay, so let's contract at a company to um, send that information to. So sharing is an example of processing. Okay, um, if they decide to um, uh, shred it, so uh, if you no longer need personal data and you decide to even discard that personal data, it's an example of processing. So anything that is done regarding personal data, what the Data Protection Act identifies as processing. So any activity, any activity that is done from collection to retrieval to disposal is what is referred to as processing. So at this point, we've looked at about five concepts. We've looked at personal data, we've looked at data subjects, we've looked at data controller, data processor, and processing. Now the final one at the left, at the right bottom is consent. All right, so consent, uh, I'm sure if I were to go around and ask for your feedback, you all have uh, an idea when it comes to consent. Now under data protection, there are some key things that we need to note under consent. One, consent has to be freely given. So you are not under compulsion to give your consent. And one of, in our presentations, one, my colleague will touch on the right of a data subject, or your right and my right. So consent has to be freely given. Consent has to be freely given. Number two, consent has to be, has to be an unambiguous indication of what your personal data will be used for, okay? So it has to be an, un, uh, an unambiguous identification of what to use the personal data for, okay? So um, basically, that's what comes under consent, and it also has to be written as well. So these are some of the key features when you talk about consent. So we've touched on the key themes under data protection. We've looked at the personal data, we've looked at the data subjects, we've looked at the data controller, processing, and then consent as well. Next week, we are going to look at the principles of data protection. Um, principles are, uh, are standards which guides, um, which guides institutions guides us, okay? If I were to go around, each of us would have a certain principle by which we live by, okay? So under data protection, there are certain principles that guides us. Uh, in one of our sessions, one person asks that, okay, so these principles that you are saying, are they, um, are, are they, are they just um, a wishful thinking or there are things that are just, you are just saying that they are nice things we should have? No. These principles are enshrined in the Data Protection Act. For reference, you can look at Section 17 of the Data Protection Act. 
So it talks about eight principles, and I will touch on each of the principles. We have accountability. We have specification of purpose. We have lawfulness. We have openness. We have data security safeguards. We have data subject participation. We have compatibility of data processing with purpose of collection. And we have lawfulness of processing. So in my presentation, I'll touch on each of these principles. And in the subsequent presentation as well, some of the facilitators would also throw back to the principles as well. So let me start with um, the left as well. So accountability. Accountability. What comes under accountability? So the principle simply states that um, every institution that is collecting personal data, you demonstrate accountability. Now, how do you demonstrate accountability? One, by being responsible for the personal data that you are taking. Be responsible. Be responsible for the personal data that you are taking. And also demonstrate how you are protecting the privacy of the individual. So under this principle, not only are you um, um, collecting it or you, 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 you just have it, but you also demonstrate how you are protecting the privacy of the individual. So one may ask, how, how do I do that? One of the ways by way is by ensuring that you do, you do not infringe on the rights of a data subject, okay? And in, in the subsequent presentation, we'll touch on what your rights are, what my rights are. Another way is by ensuring that you put together written contracts when dealing with third parties. So in my earlier example, I mentioned the bank and a marketing company. So they've contracted them to send messages to their client. Now, in providing that service, you must ensure that there has to be a written contract. In the written contract, you specify what kinds of personal data the marketing company would have. You specify how they want, you want them to use that data, and even after they, they are done, how you want that data to be discarded as well. You also, um, under accountability too, we look at having data protection policies. One of the data protection policies that every organization needs to have is a retention policy. Data, data, so data has a life cycle, okay? There is the, 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 the beginning, the collection, the storage to the disposal. So you do not collect data for a period longer than is necessary. I'll cover that in a bit in under uh, lawfulness of processing. So accountability, you need to demonstrate how you are collecting that personal data. Demonstrate how you are collecting the personal data through the policies you are having, through written contracts. Um, and also, um, another aspect is by ensuring that you appoint what we call a data protection supervisor. We'll touch on who a data protection supervisor is as well. All right, so basically that comes under uh, the principle of accountability. So also following from, from the left, we have lawfulness of processing. So under lawfulness of processing, we are looking at um, the, the fact that um, if you want to process, so if you want to process, if the controller or the processor has to process data fairly, one thing is that you must ensure that whatever personal data you are taking, you do not take personal data which is excessive. It must be relevant. Okay, for the work that you are doing. Um, the technical term is what we call minimality. So personal data you, you are taking must ensure that one, it is not excessive, one, it is relevant for the purpose for which you are collecting the personal data. Number two, under lawfulness two, we are looking at the basis for which you are collecting. So under the act, there are two um, 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 basis for which one will collect personal data. Number one is consent. So you take it from the data subjects directly. Number two is justification. Now, justification means that one, um, in for, is there a, a contract between the parties for which the collection of personal data would be required? Number two, is there a legal obligation to take that personal data? So if you're taking personal data, you need two things. One, either you, you write on consent, so it means that you take it directly from the data subjects or two, justification, implying that you need a legal mandate to take the personal data, or you're taking it in fulfillment of a contract between the, the, the parties. So that comes under lawfulness. Let me, let me state here that um, 
in um, as as data subjects. Okay, so um, in in our era. Uh, we have various social media platforms. We love to post things and uh, on on various sites. So, one um, under lawfulness, the data controller must ensure that they, they, they take personal data directly from the data subjects. However, the data controller can take it indirectly. One, if the data is made publicly available. So you've posted it on your social media platform. Okay, it's online. It's accessible. Okay. So in that case, the data controller could access the personal data. Let me move to specification of purpose. So under this principle, like the name implies, it simply means that take data for a specific purpose. So I'm collecting your name. So for example, came in, there was an attendance sheet. They, they are taking the data probably to know the number of people who are here at this session. So it's for a specific purpose. Maybe after that, they will send us um, forms to evaluate a specific purpose. So the purpose for collection has to be specific. Then we relate it to compatibility of further processing. So what this principle simply means is that if you're taking personal data for, um, um, for, yes, for a specific purpose, one, make sure that it is related to the original purpose. If it is different from the original purpose, then you need to go back to the data subjects and seek their consent. Okay, so that is critical. If you are taking personal data, it must be related to the original purpose for which you took the personal data. If it is different, then you need to go back and seek consent as well. All right, so at the moment, we've covered accountability, lawfulness, specification of purpose, and then compatibility. Let me come down to um, from the left. So looking at uh, quality of information. So under the Act, uh, quality of information simply means that whatever personal data you are taking, three things. Make sure that it is complete, it is accurate, it is up to date. Complete, accurate, and up to date. So, and this is an example I usually use. So you joined an organization. Uh, when you joined, you were not married. Okay. Last month, you got married. So then I ask you, what aspect of personal data would need to be updated? Okay, you, one, your surname would need to be updated. Maybe your nest of kin would need to be updated. Your, your, your residential address would need to be updated. So that comes under this principle, quality of information. What, there has to be measures to ensure that whatever information you have of your subject, it is complete, accurate, and up to date. Also, under this principle, the Act mandates under Section 27 and then Section 46 that data controllers have to register with the Commission. If they are registered, then they need to renew their license every two years. Okay? So, under this Act, under the uh, quality of information, um, sorry, um, openness, rather, yes, and now under openness, it's the Act requires that every data controller that handles personal data have to register or renew their license. So connecting it with openness, openness simply means that be transparent about what you're using personal data for. Okay, so I should know that, okay, this personal data you are taking, you are going to use it for A, B, and C. If you change the purpose, then you need to refer it back to me or back to you to say that, okay, this data, I'm going to use it for this other purpose, so I need to let you know. So just for be transparent. We need to be transparent about how we are using our personal data. And like I said earlier, under that principle, which is openness, the Act mandates every data controller to register and renew. The subsequent presentation will touch on how to do the registration, okay, and um, as well as the renewal. Now, the final two principles are data security safeguards and then data subject participation. Uh, if I were to ask what the data subject participation is, uh, um, some may say that ensure that the data subject participates in the data collection. Okay, so data security safeguards, what that simply means is that ensure that you have technical and organizational measures in place to protect the personal data. Okay, so technical and, and organizational measures in place. Uh, you, there's what we call privacy by, by design. So privacy must be built by default. Okay, organizations must be proactive and not reactive. Okay, ensure that you are putting in measures to protect whatever personal data you hold in store. So that comes under the data security safeguard. Under data security safeguard as well, there's, uh, under the Act, every entity is, needs to have what we call a data protection supervisor. 
Okay, we'll look at who a data protection supervisor is as well as uh, what their role is. So you need to have someone in place who will ensure that one, the organization is complying with the mandates of the act. Number two, in case you need to do any project, the data protection supervisor, permits me to use DPS, would ensure that you undertake data protection impact assessment. Okay, would also ensure that three, if there are any breaches, the data protection supervisor would report to the commission as well. Now, finally, data subjects uh, participation. Um, so ensure that the data subjects simply participate in the data collection. Now, how do you participate? Have you been participating at all? Okay, so how do you participate? What it simply means is that um, the data subject has the right to assess their personal information, okay, under the Act, Section 32. You have the right to assess your personal information. So you can approach any data controller and request them to provide to you whatever personal information that they hold. The Act, however, says that it will come at a reasonable cost. Okay, so in providing that information to come at a reasonable cost, and you have the right under the Act to request for personal information held about you. So at this point, we've looked at the mandates of the Commission. We've looked at some key terms under the Act. We've also looked at the eight principles under the Data Protection um, Act as well. Uh, my final two slides will touch on, in summary, the key obligations of data controllers, and then finally we'll touch on uh, breaches. So like I said earlier, um, connecting it to the principles, one, uh, you need to implement technical and organizational measures. Uh, this include having a retention policy, having, a pr having privacy policies as well. Um, we also have um, register with the commission and then renew every two years. So if you are registered already, the act requires that you renew your license every two years. Okay, and then um, appoint a data protection supervisor. We'll touch on this in our subsequent slides. Now, you need to demonstrate compliance to the Act. I mentioned it under the principle of accountability. You demonstrate compliance to the Act, and the key word is demonstration. Okay, you will need to have compliance reports, you need to have the policies to show, you need to indicate how you are, you are protecting the privacy of individuals. And then we need to also need to give instructions to third parties, okay? So if you contract any other company, okay, to provide some service for you, you need to give instructions to them. Written contracts, okay, that is critical. And then notification of breaches as well. So I'll um, tie into the last, to the last presentation, which is um, the notification of uh, security compromises. So the Act requires under Section 31 that where there are reasonable grounds to believe that personal data has been assessed or acquired by an unauthorized person, the data controller shall notify without undue delay after becoming aware. So the act requires that if there is any compromise or any security breach, you are required under the act to report such breaches to the commission. The data protection supervisor, which we uh, earlier on mentioned and will touch on in our subsequent presentation, could also facilitate in ensuring that um, when there are breaches, they work with the commission in reporting same. So thank you for listening, and um, we'll engage subsequently. Thank you very much. We can do it better than this, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Seth Fosukwaten, for the enlightenment you've shared with us this morning. I'm sure we are grabbing a lot of information and then we will act on it when we leave here. I want to bring to your attention that um, this session is streaming live on our various social media platforms. So on YouTube and then on Facebook, we are live. You can share the pages for other people to also have what we are having this morning. Next on the bill, we have a presentation from Mr. Dennis Dakwa. He is going to take us through the data protection software. Can we please welcome with a round of applause? Distinguished guests, all other product protocols observed, good morning. Uh, my presentation today would, I would want to continue from where my, el the earlier presentation ended. He touched briefly on the Data Protection Act and some basic 
uh, introductory information is that uh, we ought to know about data protection. In this last slide, last but one slide, he talked about the obligations of the data controller. The Data Protection Act simply puts, gives rights to data subjects, that's you and I, whose personal data are collected, and puts obligations on the data controller, that's whoever is controlling the data and then determining what and how those information needs to be processed. And in his, one of his uh, submissions, he made mention that the, one of the obligations of the data controller is to make sure they register with the Data Protection Commission and ensure that in every two years, they renew. Now, to help us to, to, to help them to do this, a uh, system has been developed, put together to uh, facilitate this process. Section 46 of the Act requires that the commission keeps and maintains a data protection register. And obviously the commission is only one, we have our only one office. And everybody or every data controller or data processor in Ghana is supposed to register. To help this to, to, to go on, what we have done is that we've made the registration easily accessible and it's made online. So a system has been developed to help us do the registration. We will touch, we will touch briefly on the system as we move on. Please, can we take our slides? Okay. Now, compliance with Data Protection Act. Compliance in general, you and I would understand that it's a journey. It's not a one-stop event. It's not you are compli you've complied today, and so that is it. Many a times, people come to the commission and they are like, we are registered. Yes, we have our certificate, and that is it. The registration to the commission is the first stage of compliance. When you register, the next, there are other things that you have to do. But most often than not, people register and then they are looking at the certificate and says, I am registered, and that is it. So I want us all to draw attention that compliance, just as privacy compliance or data protection compliance, is a journey, but not a one-stop event. And next slide, please. Now, as I earlier mentioned, Section 46 of the Act, Data Protection Act, mandates the Commission to keep and maintain a data protection register. Just about a week ago, our new software, which is designed to aid compliance, was launched by our able minister, Madam Osla Usu. And I would like to talk about a few features of the, of, of the system, how it works. One, the system it's giving us a self-assessment, okay, and high-level compliance status. So, somebody registers. The question is, after registering, what next? A system is designed such that when you register, the system itself is going to tell you what next you are supposed to do. Uh, you do a self-assessment, know your risk, and then help you to put, after you have done that, it gives you at least a gross idea what you have in your, in your organization and how you can go on to put in place a privacy program. Now, I would actually want to talk about how the system runs. But before then, the system is, it has a two phase, the back end and the front end. The front end is available for you and I. If you want to check whether any organization you're dealing with is responsible, in terms of it's being compliant. You see, when an organization is not registered with the Data Protection Commission, what the, what the organization is trying to tell us is that he is not ready to be open to the Data Protection Commission or the data subject. In that, he is collecting personal data from you. If he, is, if he has nothing to hide, why is he not opening up to the commission? A commission has been set up to ensure that the processing of personal data in the country is regulated. So if anybody is processing personal data and the person is not ready or the institution is not ready to let the commission know the reasons for processing the personal data, then of course, you and I have cause to believe that there's something the person is hiding. And so in, in this case, I would advise, the best thing to do is that you don't deal with such an institution. To be able to help you do this, we have made the front end of uh, the software easily accessible to you and I, everybody. So you can go to our website 
and search for any uh, company, whether the person is registered or not. So the URL on your, on your screen lead you directly to where you can search for entities who are in good standing with the Data Protection Commission. Okay. Next slide, no. So after you've gone there, then you can now put in, you just type in anything, any keyword of any institution you want to search. You, you key in there and then it will populate. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is how it will show. If you have put in, in place, you put in any company's name, it will come as this. Now, if you can see, at the last far end of it, we have three colors. If you can identify, we have the blue, we have uh, amber, and we have red. Now, this state tells us the, 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 status, the, the status of the registration, whether it has expired, it's about to expire, or it, is, it has not expired. Let me put it that way. Now, when you see amber, it means that it is three months to expiry. And the system is designed that whenever it's three months to expiry, that's 90 days, you have a notification. That is the data controller has a notification that, hey, your data protection registration is about to expire. So, so start putting in place the next step to do the renewal. Of course, the renewal comes with other things, like my colleague said, uh, compliance report, putting in place a compliance report. So starting the registration early, can help you go through, three months to registration can take you through, help you going through the compliance report, and by the time it has expired, you may have gone through and then registered and duly have your renewal certificates and renewal registration ready. Now, when it is read, then it is telling you indeed, you have, you have gone past expiry, you, are, you have expired. So if you are searching for any company and then you realize that the company's uh, color is showing red, it is giving you an indication that this company, uh, this company's registration has expired and needs uh, to be renewed. And that if that has not been done, it means that per the commission, the company is not in good standing. Okay. Now, we can search and know basic information on companies that are in good standing or companies that are listed on, our, on, 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 on the search register. So when you want to know the basic information, just click on the, the last stream, there's, there's an, an icon that looks like an eye. You click on it, and there will be a very basic information about the company, like their name, their contact details, at least something basic about the company for you to identify the company. Okay. Now, I would want to talk about the, some key features of a new system. The new system is designed to help us to go through our compliance journey easily. Now, there are key features, and I'll talk about them one after the other. We have the pay, payment and the invoices. We have the roadmap and risk assessment questionnaire. We have uploading evidence and documents, and then we have managing online accounts and payment. I'll take one, them one after the other and then we go through it. Now, this system has given us, after you have registered with us, after you have registered with the commission, uh, an invoice at the last stage of a registration is generated for you. This, there, there is a thread of this order, there's, there, there's uh, uh, an audit trail of this invoice that you have registered. So let's say if you have your first registration, second registration, third registration, all these invoices will be kept for you. Previously, the invoice that the, the system that we were using couldn't give you a track on the invoices and the information you previously put there. But now, we have been able to design a new system to give track on the invoices and the information that you have already provided. Take for instance, some, some people come to the commission and say, we, somebody, the person who did the registration for us is no more there. Can you give us the information that were provided, the, init the initial information that was provided for us to know what and what information were provided. This system has been designed such that when you provide an information, it is kept for you so you can have an audit trail, go through it, and then update them as and when you need to update them, just as the invoice. So you don't lose the invoice. In initially, the, the system that we were using, an invoice is generated and then 
when the registration ends, that's you are doing the renewal, the next registration overrides the invoice that we have. What we have here is an upgrade of what we used to have. The invoice that you have is still kept, and so you're able to keep track of the various invoices that we have over a period of time. Now, the compliance roadmap, we'll talk about that uh, in, the, in the next slide, so I'd want to keep that. The compliance roadmap, after you have registered, I've already told you, the registration, the compliance is not an, 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 an event, but a journey. Now, after you have registered, the system gives you a roadmap, okay? It, 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 gives, you, it, it gives you a roadmap, so you would know, uh, for instance, it would let you know what you're supposed to do after you have registered. I've registered, what next? Okay, so a roadmap will be given to you so that you can follow. Now, self-assessment questionnaire. The self-assessment questionnaire also helps you to know what you're supposed to do, what are your risks, and how you're going to deal with your risk. Now, uploading documents. Let's say you have, you have an evidence of information you want to provide for us. You are submitting a compliance report. You want, you want to submit to us and evidence or proof, just as my colleague said, accountability, showing, demonstrating that you said you are doing what you said you're doing. So we have also created a document section where you can, document upload section where you can upload the document to us and then you, would, you, you send it to us and then we can go through it. So it, it, it more or less, it is aiding our communication with the data controller or the data processor. We have an online, managing online account. Yes, previously, Registration was, let's say you want to start a registration for an entity. You go, you go there and then you put in, uh, initially we use some serial numbers that you have to, you have to use a TIN number and another thing. So any other person who has uh, uh, knowledge or information about the serial number or the TIN number can go in there and access your information. Now it is not so an account has to be created and managed. So whoever started the registration has access to the account and no one else has access unless he decides to give or grant access to another person to be able to access the information. So if I have your TIN number, which was the, the primary information needed for the registration and uh, your serial number, that's what we used to call it the registration number, you could have gone in there and assessed any organization's personal information. Okay. This time we have, we have to ensure, to aid the security, we have made sure that the system that we have put in place, nobody can go in there and get information, except whoever is doing the registration and whoever has been given access to do that. Now, we have the online payment. The system has given us uh, various ways we can do payment. Initially, we're only doing the payment. After you have done the, the registration, you print the invoice, you go to a bank and pay. Now, you can do online payment just after you have done the registration. You can go through it and do an online pay. So there's an online payment and an offline payment as well. So this is an additional or a key function of a new system we're talking about. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a demo of the, uh, the, 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 the demo for the registration system that we have actually talked about. I would like to talk through it. After you have created an account, a data protection account, the account that I'm talking of, the next thing is you start the registration process. And this is how it begins. Now with the registration, we have four main uh, uh, tap that you have to tap or you have to go through four, more, four main processes. We have the details process, and the details it requires that you put in your TIN number, that is a pre-requirement. And as you can see, there are always a drop downs, so we don't need to be going in and typing in. We've made sure that we don't put so many free text informations in there. So most of the information have been made, uh, uh, code, code have been coded so that it makes it easy for organizations or individuals to go through the registration process. Now we go to capacity and as we go. So in, 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 in about three minutes, you have to go, you'll be able to go through the registration process successfully without any delay or any hitches. And as you go on, every information you put there have been saved. So you don't need to go by and save again. 
So automatically the information is saved and you move to the next. When you want to change the information that you have put there, all that you have to do is you go back and then correct it. Let's say in the course of registration, you have, you have missed information out and you want to put in there. What you have to do is you can log out with your access, log out and come in and do it again. So uh, you, don't, you don't go through the registration and when you are, you've not ended, you can't you can complete it. You can complete it anytime, anywhere, when you want to. Okay, so as you can see on the screen, these are how the registration process, this is how the registration process go. As easy and convenient as possible. All that you need is a, a, work, a workstation and internet access, and you can do a registration. So after you have gone through the process, as I've already said, there is an invoice generation end where you now choose which option you want to use. Do you have to go through, do you want to do an online payment and offline payment? If it's an online payment, you go through that and use your card to do the payment right away. If it's offline, you choose the offline option and then you print the invoice that comes out, go to any Ecobank branch and do your payment. After you have done that or you send the information to us, after you have uh, registered or submitted the application, we can see it at the back end, assess that every information you have provided is actually what you need and then we can process your registration for you. I can say that uh, in, in about two weeks, the registration process, if there is no hitch, you can go through it and have your registration certificate done for you. So this is how easy our new system is. Okay, so I talked briefly on the, the roadmap. After you have done the registration, the next stage you have is the, your roadmap. This gives you what you are supposed to do next. Let's say I'm a lay person. I want to comply with the Data Protection Act. I don't know what next to do. Now, after you have registered, this roadmap will give you what next you're supposed to do. Registering, it says, after you have done that, good, appoint a data protection supervisor. So after you have registered, the next thing is that appoint somebody as a data protection supervisor, which will be talked briefly next in the next slide. The next one will be uh, book a certified data protection practitioner training. After you have appointed somebody, the person needs to be trained because he doesn't know what he's supposed to do. So the person needs training as well. The next thing is that then you put, you complete your basic privacy assessment. Okay, so there will be an assessment after this slide that you see, you complete it yourself. It's a self-assessment that you do. After you have done, then what you do is that you document your three privacy risks. So what will be your, after you have done your assessment, what is your top risk that you have identified? You know it. After you have done that, you put in place a privacy program to address the risk that has been identified. And the next thing is that you prepare for your next renewal. The renewal is uh, most 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 at times people wait till it's it's just close to the renewal date and they want to renew. After you have done the renewal, start just after you have done your first registration. You look at putting in place your your report. Now report the reporting. You would want to identify the risk that you have and what measures you put in place to address those risks. So. We as a commission are interested in the report anyway, but our interest is ensuring that whatever you have put there, you'll be able to one, identify the risk, your state of your compliance at the time of the report, and what plan you put in place to ensure that you address the risk or the gap that you have identified. So you can start identifying your gap right after your first registration, and by the time you are due for renewal, you may have identified and start working on your gaps. Okay, so briefly as I, told, I, I, I spoke about, this is the compliance assessment. There are 10 high level questionnaires that you look, you will see after you have done the registration, you just go through it, just answer them as correctly as it is, and then you have a score. After you have had a score, the score will show you whether you are high risk, medium risk, or low risk. Then the next thing is that if it is high, then what do you have to do? put in place a program. If it is low, then, so it, 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 help us, it helps you to know your risk status 
and how you have to identify or address those risks. Okay. I talked briefly about the document upload section. Okay. So on, on, on the portal, we have a document upload section. You can go there and, and upload any information you want to give us. If you want to even show to us your pay, your pre, the proof of your payment, you can go to the document section, upload it, and you'll find it. If you want to give to us our, your compliance report, you can send it. You can upload it at the document upload section, and then you'll find it at the end, and then respond accordingly. So any information like a, a copy of your policy, a copy of your uh, privacy notice or statement, all of them could be uploaded on the document upload section. So entirely, you realize that the new system helps to communicate with us virtually without any hitch. Okay, so unlike traveling to the commission anytime, the system has been denied, designed such that you can communicate with us through the system and then you would know what you're supposed to do as and when it's supposed to be done. Next slide, please. Okay. So I would want to end here and my next colleague will come and take the next point to, to give you the next presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Dennis Dakwa, for the um, presentation on the data protection software. So connecting our dots, Mr. Setofosu Kwaten indicated that as part of the obligations of data controllers, they are supposed to register with the Data Protection Commission. And Mr. Dennis Dakwa has also given us a brief presentation of how we can do the registration with the commission, with the user-friendly system they have built. Can we please give it up to them for, again? We would take our health break, but then before that, I'm sure maybe you would have some questions. If we do have questions, we open up for a few questions. Um, the data protection team is here. They would respond to us. So if you have questions based on the presentation, the two presentations, if we do have questions. All right, sir. Thank you very much. During the last presentation that I listened to, I listened with rapt attention, thinking I'll hear something about cost, but I have not heard anything like that. Is there anything in terms of cost that you have to bear in this whole registration process? Thank you very much. So I relate this question to the data protection team. Do we have any cost implications with the registration? Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, sorry for not actually telling you whether there was cost. There is a cost attached to it. The cost is not, it's marginal, it's a very small cost. You, you, you can afford, yes. Yes, it's, 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 it's a set cost from uh, uh, Parliament. It's been gathered by Parliament. The highest that anybody can uh, register or pay is 1,800, and the least is uh, 120 cities for two years. So... That I'm sure wouldn't be much for organizations. Yeah. And then and then and the next one is a 900 cities. So it's 1,800, 900, and then 120 cities. Okay. So the as 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 the the 1,800 is for large scale uh, organizations. The uh, the middle the, the 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 900 is for the medium scale, medium to small scale, and then the 120. It's a small scale company. It's, it's a new currency, please. 900 cities, new currency. Okay. So, the, the, as, the, once again, the criteria is also set by parliament. You are, you are, you are high when you are collecting personal data above 250, yeah, you are high. Again, if you fall under a certain specific uh, industry, straight away, you go into the high, high class, like the bank, financial institutions. Yes, you go into a set by, uh, by, 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 by parliament and how you're supposed to collect them.
practically knows where he or she and um, where the company falls. Yeah, so I wanted to add something small. So it's not only, there are two things we look at. One is the amount or the magnitude of data that you collect. And then two is the sensitivity of the data that you collect. So there are some, for instance, some, you, you know, you can consider the Momo guys. Uh, their setup, their business setup is very small. But truth is, they take a lot of data. They take a lot of personal data. And quite apart from that, you could say that their data is very sensitive because it has to do with money, somebody's money in their account. And so we have to, uh, the, the, the act gives the commission the, that leverage to discuss and to look at the, the situation at hand. That's the reason why you may not necessarily find it in our, on our website saying X, A, B, C, D makes you high or low. But as you are registering, we have our teams in place that will dialogue with you and let you understand why you are, you are high, medium, or low. Is that okay? Thanks. Are there other questions? And the last one. Okay, so um, I want to know if the Data Protection Commission has plans on protect in the future protecting data from the informal sector. You would want to know if the Data Protection Commission has got plans, or they are, or they already do that. I don't know. I just want to know if they have plans on protecting the data of from for the informal sector. Informal sector. Yeah. I will relay the question back to the team. Okay, so per the act, every organization or institution individual who intends to collect or process personal data is supposed to register. So there is neither informal or formal sector. If you have the intention alone to collect or process personal data, you are supposed to make the data protection aware by registering. And that we regulate every information whether informal or formal as well. Okay. And uh, again, the act binds the republic. Yeah. Everybody. Okay. All right. In addition to that, the commission also provides um, some awareness to data controllers or institutions, whether the public or the private sector, to enable them to understand the obligation as well. So we have bespoke awareness that is tailored to each institution to enable them to understand how they can comply, as well as drop-in sessions at our office as well. Free drop-in sessions. We will take last two questions. Yes, sir. Yes, I would like to find out if there are sanctions for non-compliance, and if there are, what are they? All right. Hi, good morning everyone. My name is Sylvia Peer. I'm a, a private sector organization dealing with data protection, training and services. Now the reason why I've offered to answer this question is I also deliver the practitioner's training. So this comes um, every time we run the course. There are sections. Now if you look at section 95, there is a general penalty and it says something like that. If you don't comply with the requirements of the act, the ultimate decision maker, the CEO, or the chief director in that matter, is liable to a prison sentence up to five or 10 years in some cases. It also says uh, there are some penalty points, which in Ghana we, ha we, we call it um, penalty points. It's 12 cities equivalent to a point. So in some instances, it is 5,000 equivalent. Now you might be sitting there thinking it is not a lot of money for some of the organizations like uh, banks and all that. But what, what the cost of uh, uh, not complying to this act, is think about the trust of your customers, your clients, the, your reputation. Imagine your organization being in the press saying you are not following data protection and there are issues. That is the real cost that we need to consider, not what the commission will find you or not find you. But yes, there are, there are other sections. For example, if you buy or sell data, there are, there are uh, sanctions in the act. But what I would like you to take away is that look at it holistically. 
not just a, um, a price tag. Otherwise, nobody will comply because all of us might be able to pay the fines in the acts. Hope it's okay. Thank you, Madam Sylvia. So, probably, I would uh, like you to throw more light on if you are talking about organization, registering or collecting data or information uh, and personnel. I want to understand very clearly because somebody may have his or her own organization and wanted to register his or her members. Or I don't really know how. Is it public? Is it private? You have to set a, a, a clear distinction between this. And also, how does this uh, Data Protection Commission manages uh, data and information? I want to get clearance on that as well. Thank All right, you. back to the data protection team. He wants to know how the Data Protection Commission manages information, and then if he has got a private inf um, organization, can he register his staff or something? I, maybe you, you, you'd have to give the, a bit of clarification there. Yes, thank you very much. So the first one, that is how, let me, let me talk about um, how the Data Protection Commission manages data and all that. You see, that's, this tells us that, of course, data protection is a fairly new uh, concept, if I should say that, in, in this region, in Africa and in Ghana, for, for that matter. So we don't manage, sometimes I have the impression that people think we have a big system, in our office and it's managing everybody's data. You see when you are eating and when you are using the worship, we don't do that. We are regulators. Our responsibility is to make sure that you as a private, uh, you know, private business owner, you are complying by a set of rules which is stated in the act, an act that has been published by the government of Ghana. So we are regulators, making sure that everybody who takes somebody's personal data is, is complying to some, some number of rules. So that when the person does that, we now speaking perhaps for the government, the government is rest assured that people's personal data are protected. So Data Protection Commission does not manage people's data. We don't do that. Our responsibility is that we are regulators training and making sure that everybody, whether public or the, the act actually says that uh, the, 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 you know, the law binds the republic. So even if you're one person, you establish a company today and you have employed one other person, you have collected personal data and you have to register. And so it binds, it binds churches, mosques, uh, big companies, small, everybody is because because every one person matters to the, to, the, to the nation. And so that's very clear. Everybody must register as, as long as they're taking some form of somebody's personal data. Two, the Data Protection Commission does not manage people's data. We don't have a big system and software that is looking at where everybody's driving into and we don't do that. We regulate data controllers and data processors. We tell them, you cannot do this. You can do that. You cannot treat somebody's data like that. You, if somebody has a problem with MTN or something, or uh, somebody has taken their data and they think they have a right that is being infringed on, they call on us, and we interpret the law so that they are not uh, unduly affected. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Patrick. I'll take the last question, and then we can break for our health break. If there are no other questions, then we, in 10 minutes, we are taking our health break. When we come back, we will take a presentation from Dr. Patrick Adunu. Yes, so um, the ushers will direct us to the dining hall. Within the last three and a half years of our establishment,